bringing this first word to his congregation. I pray, Lord, that you would bless the both of us as we bring your word to your people. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As Jesus hung suffering and dying on the cross, he looked down and he saw soldiers gambling for his clothes. He saw religious leaders mocking him. He looked to either side. He saw two criminals, one of whom was criticizing him. And then he looked up and said, Father, forgive them, Amen. for they do not know what they are doing. He didn't ask God to punish them or to kill them, but to forgive them. Amen. This, his first word on the cross, was to ask God to forgive his enemies. Even when they had not at this point asked for forgiveness, nor did they deserve forgiveness. I don't think it's any coincidence that this is his first word. All of Jesus' words from the cross are important, but his first word has an eternal impact on us because his first word, forgive them, and his death on the cross saves us. Now, before we talk about forgiveness and what it is, let's talk about what it is not. When you forgive someone, it doesn't mean you condone or you excuse what they did to you. Right? It does not mean that you uh, deny the seriousness of the offense. It doesn't mean you pretend it didn't happen. It doesn't mean you release them from legal responsibility, if that applies. And lastly, it does not mean you forgive and forget. And if you don't forget, it doesn't mean you haven't forgiven. I've heard so many people say we're supposed to forgive and forget. No. God's word does not tell us to forgive and forget. We are only commanded to forgive. Yes, we remember the offense. But when we truly forgive, we treat that person as if it never happened. And we don't remember the incident with anger or with rage. Now, God does forget our sins. It says so in Isaiah 43, 25. I, I am he who blocked out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Now, God is omniscient, and he knows all of our sins. But when we belong to him, we are not condemned for our sins, but we are, in fact, forgiven. So I think in that sense, God forgives and forgets. The reason we don't forget is because we were created and designed by God to have memory. We can't selectively decide to remember some things and forget others unless we're traumatized. Things that we want to remember, we forget. Things we want to forget, we remember. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about this memory that God has given us. Memory is very detailed and it's complicated. It's stored in many different areas across the cerebral cortex of the brain, particularly in the hippocampus. There are three types of memory. There's sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory. There are three stages of memory, encoding, storage, retrieval. And there are three main ways that we encode or process information. Visually, that involves what we see. Acoustics involves sounds. Semantics involves the meaning of words. If time permitted, I would have elaborated on all of this, but it does not. <laughs> I only discuss a small segment about memory. I share this information with you to show you how complicated and detailed memory is and to show you how fearfully and wonderfully you are made. Amen. Right. And to impress upon you that God intends for us to remember things. All right. So when anything happens to us, be it good or bad, mm -hmm. it's intended that we will remember it. Thank you, Lord. you need to remember it so you can face it. Once you face it, you forgive, and then you move on. Right. Right. We will not forgive and forget, but we should and must forgive. Mm -hmm. Now that we've established what forgiveness is not, let's talk about what forgiveness is. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Jesus is talking to God, addressing him as Father, a term of endearment and love, and evidence of their relationship. He's God's son, so he calls him Father. It's the same relationship we should have with God, our Father. Forgive them. Jesus is asking God to forgive them for all the wrongdoings that led up to his crucifixion. Even on the cross, enduring unbearable agony and pain, he was praying for his enemies, interceding for them, and asking God to forgive them. So what is forgiveness? Well, the dictionary defines forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision 
to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether that person actually deserves forgiveness. In other words, let it go. What does the Bible say about forgiveness? We're only going to look at a few verses, and we're going to start with the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 12, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. As God forgives us, we are to forgive others. As means in the way or manner. So we are to forgive in the way or manner that God forgives. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I don't think any further clarification is needed on that verse. Luke 17, 3 through 4. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. That means to reprimand or to scold them. And if they repent, forgive them. Okay. Even if they sin against you seven times in the day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive. Okay. Take home message here, forgiveness is not an option. Okay. Matthew 18, 21 through 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Now, figuratively speaking, that means we should forgive countless times, an infinite number of times, mm -hmm. or in other words, every time. Mm -hmm. Every time someone offends us and asks for forgiveness, we must forgive them. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that's how many times God forgives us mm -hmm. when we ask for forgiveness. And remember, we have to forgive as, in the way or manner that God forgives. And we just read in the aforementioned scriptures that we are commanded to forgive. So we forgive to be obedient to God. But we also forgive because harboring unforgiveness negatively affects you mentally, physically, and spiritually. And because of that, I feel that even if the person doesn't ask for forgiveness, we should still forgive them. One quote put it this way and sums it up nicely. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison yourself and waiting for the other person to die. <laughs> <laughs> Unforgiveness poisons you, but forgiveness brings peace. Amen. So Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Who is them? Is it Judas who betrayed Jesus? Is it the Roman soldiers who arrested him, the ones who beat him, or the ones who nailed him to the cross? Is it Pilate who knew Jesus was innocent but washed his hands of the matter, refusing to take responsibility for his death? Is it Herod and his soldiers who ridiculed and mocked Jesus? Is it the chief priests and the Sanhedrin who were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death? Is it the false witnesses who testified against Jesus? Is it the crowd who demanded the release of Barabbas but said to crucify Jesus? Is it Peter who denied him not once, not twice, but three times? Is it the two thieves on either side, one of whom was curling insults at him? Is it us? Mm -hmm. He was interceding for all of us. Thank you, Lord. After all, he died for all of us. Yeah. He died so that our sins may be forgiven. And while he was dying on the cross, he was interceding on behalf of them and us. But to receive that forgiveness, we must repent. Amen. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. They do not know what they are doing. 1 Corinthians 2, 8 says, None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The Roman soldiers didn't know they were crucifying the Son of God. They were just obeying an order. And while Pilate knew that Jesus hadn't committed any crimes, he did not know that he had been sent by God. The Jewish rulers didn't understand the prophecies and were unwilling to believe that Jesus was truly sent by God. They did not know that he was, in fact, the Messiah. They expected a different Messiah, and they were unwilling to examine the evidence before them. They all did not know the magnitude of the sin and judgment that they were bringing on themselves. But what if they did know what they were doing? Would God still forgive them if they asked for forgiveness? And the answer is a resounding yes. Forgiveness of sin was the reason Jesus died on the cross. Amen. He was interceding for them then, and he continues to intercede for us today. That's right. It was Jesus himself who said, you ought to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And even while dying on the cross, 
He was practicing what he preached. Dying on the cross, he provided forgiveness for anyone and everyone who would believe in him and ask for forgiveness. As he forgives us, we are to forgive others. When we do not forgive, it reveals how we feel about Christ. John 14, 24 says, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So Christ is Not two days ago, but today, today. we will be Hello. if we. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity, Lord. I ask you to use me, Lord. Send my heart, my mind, my thoughts, my words, Heavenly Father. And please, Lord, use me as you see fit. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Luke 23, 43. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. At this point, Jesus has been betrayed, arrested, falsely accused, stripped of his clothes, and forced to wear a crown of thorns. He has been beaten, mocked, spat on and paraded through the streets. He endured an unimaginable amount of physical and emotional pain. While the pain endured, Jesus was nailed to a cross between two criminals. In Luke 15, 32, we discover that at some point, both of the criminals mocked Jesus as all three of them hung from the crosses. At some point during the crucifixion, one of the criminals who mocked Jesus had a change of heart. Now I'm not sure when the change took place or what caused the change, but what I do know is that after Jesus asked his heavenly father to forgive the people who caused his suffering, one criminal went from mocking Jesus to fearing Jesus. In Luke 23, 39, one criminal said to the other, don't you fear God, even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then the criminal turned and said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I learned the meaning and importance of fearing God and Bible study. <laughs> Psalm 147, 10 through 11 says, he takes no pleasure in the strength of a horse or in human might. No, the Lord delights in those who fear him, those who put their hope in his unfailing love. The fear being expressed in Psalm is not the fear that makes your skin crawl or your knees shake. It is a reverent fear, a deep, a feeling of deep respect and devotion to God or for God. This criminal showed a reverent fear of God, and I believe God shows us through this criminal's interaction with Jesus that we cannot get into God's kingdom with academic degrees, physical feats, special acts, money or good looks. The criminal simply says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Amen. He couldn't show Jesus how strong he was. He couldn't provide a service. There was no written testament. He had no money to give, and I'm sure he was not looking his best. But he gave what Jesus desires from all of us a profession of faith yeah. from a sincere heart. Amen. For Romans 10.10 10 says, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. Amen. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Yeah. Now look what happened in verse 43. When the criminal professes his faith, Jesus replies, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus gives the criminal the gift of eternal life 
right there on the cross. Through all Jesus' pain and suffering, he took the time to hear the criminal's request and to look into the criminal's heart. And through all the criminal's pain and suffering, he saw and felt Jesus' sovereignty. He feared Jesus, and in that moment, made a profession of faith. This man was not one of Jesus' beloved disciples. He was not one of his followers. He was not one of the men who Jesus spent time loving, caring for, and, de and developing during his ministry. There was no evidence that Jesus ministered to this criminal before being hung on the cross, and there's no evidence that the criminal saw any of the miracles Jesus performed. The criminal was just a regular man hanging from a neighboring cross, enduring the events of his own crucifixion while witnessing the crucifixion of Jesus. He was guilty of his crimes and deserved the punishment he received. He deserved death. But in the midst of his reverent fear and profession of faith, God saw into his heart and gave him the gift of eternal life. Amen. We're never told what the criminal did to end up on the cross. We don't know what either of them did. The significance of these unknown facts confirm what is said in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. It does not matter what they did. Eternal life can only be attained through a heart that fears God and, and a profession of faith in what Jesus did for the world on the cross. After reading Luke 23, 43, across several versions of the Bible, the word today started jumping out at me. When I hear the word today, I think right now, in this present moment, without delay, without pause, without hesitation, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus assured the criminal that he would see eternal life immediately, without hesitation. So if you're wondering which criminal you may represent today, let me share something with you. You can choose to be the one who received the eternal, who received the gift of eternal life from Jesus. You can receive the gift by professing your faith in Jesus with a sincere heart. Your today does not start or end by hanging from the cross like the criminal. You, excuse me, what you've done in life up to this point will never keep you from Jesus' promise of eternal life. Amen. Everyone has a choice, and just like the criminal, everyone can have a changed heart. You can choose Jesus today, and when you profess your faith in Jesus, you will receive a daily flow of love, compassion, grace, mercy, and an immediate promise to be with Jesus in paradise. saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his home, to his own home. Jesus with nails in his hands and feet, a crown of thorns on his head, and beaten beyond recognition, torn flesh, barely able to breathe, left space <coughs> to care for his mother. Here is Mary, the mother of Jesus. She has to be playing back the recordings in her mind, everything she experienced, witnessed, and pondered in her heart. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Elizabeth, in a loud voice, exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. 
Who wouldn't think life would be smooth for the mother of the Messiah? I have had conversations with people who mistakenly believe after they gave their heart and made their, their heart to Jesus and made him Lord of their life, everything should be easy. <clears throat> but life can be anything but. Amen. Because that's not the promise. The promise in Hebrews 13.5 is he will never leave us or forsake us. Amen. So did Mary replay the message from Gabriel? The Holy Spirit knitting Jesus in her womb? The skeptics, including Joseph, not believing how the Christ was conceived. The travel to Bethlehem. The shepherds finding him and worshiping the child. The magi come, worship and bring gifts. Then they moved to Egypt to hide from Herod. They moved back to Israel. They moved back to Nazareth to hide from Herod's son. They lose Jesus for three days and find him holding his own in the temple. He turns water to wine. He heals the sick. The lame, he gives sight to the blind, and he raises the dead. But maybe no other words sang out louder at this moment to her than those of Simeon when Mary and Joseph went to the temple. Luke 2, 34, 5. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of man in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Stretched between heaven and earth, he is the son of God, the son of David, the son of man, and the son of Mary. But she is a bondservant of the Most High God, so he is also her Messiah, her God, and her Savior. But her grief, but her, but her great faith but in her great faith did she also have doubts. Not the same, not for the same reason, but could she also have been saved like a crowd? Save yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, what were her sons? Matthew 13, 55. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother named Mary? And aren't there aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Now, let's not be too hard on them. Can you imagine being Jesus' sibling? <laughs> As the Christian comedian Michael Jr. says, don't be Jesus' brother James and be at the party and the wine runs out. <laughs> Everybody looking at you. <laughs> they struggled with unbelief, just like us. They had, he had said some stuff that was hard to hear, and he rubbed people the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Who did he think he was? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wow. wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Mm -hmm. Jesus' brothers, in John 3, John, John chapter 7, 3 through 5, his brothers therefore said to him, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe him. Now they sound just like somebody else who gave him an if you statement. Mm -hmm. Matthew 12, 46 through 50. Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But Jesus said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. As we learn in Bible study on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, <laughs> during our study of misreading scripture with Western eyes, this statement may seem like Jesus is dismissive of his family, but he did not say they are not my family. With his question and statement, he is giving a glimpse of being adopted into the family of God. Galatians 4, 5, Ephesians 1, 5, and Romans 8, 15. But remember, we have the Bible. They didn't. This is Crucifixion Friday, and we know the whole story. They had to wait to get to Resurrection Sunday. Mm -hmm. Because we have the whole story, we also know what happens in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. 
As a newborn baby, he was weak, he was fragile, exposed, vulnerable, and in need of care and protection by his parents. Here, we have an unprecedented role reversal as he provides for his mother. He knew his mother's pain and sorrow. He knew the sorrow of a parent grieving over the loss of a child. Luke 7, 11 to 15, he went into a city called Maine, and there a widow grieved over the death of her son. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. He also brought back the life of the 12-year-old daughter of Jairus. In the absence of flesh and blood sons, Jesus gives her a son to physically wipe her tears, to console, comfort, protect, and provide for her. Because of the culture, she had to have the covering of a male. Think about it. People hated Jesus, and more than likely, they didn't care too much for his mother. Mm-hmm. Now, this is just me. Mary was probably, at this time, late 40s, early 50s. I find it interesting that he didn't give her a second husband. He didn't play matchmaker. He gave her what she needed, and that was a son. So how does all this relate to us today? You know, for those who say the Bible is outdated and not relevant anymore, the example Mary gives us saying yes to the call from God is full of joy, adventure, expectation, awe, wonder, miracles, and sorrow. Why didn't Jesus just stop Herod's heart instead of making them have to run? Why is her son dying and he's the king? For her faith, our faith, and God's purpose. She and Joseph had times of normalcy and peace. They had at least six more children. She attended weddings, had friends and families that she traveled with. But God was true to his word because the second thing the angel told her was, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And then 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Her life wasn't easy, but it had purpose. So how does how do we now relate to the disciple today when Jesus said, behold your mother? So last year, I did this same word. Since then, my mother has had a car accident and no longer drives, and so she has lost some of her independence, and I had to lean into her life and do things for her that prior she was able to do for herself. Vincent's parents, this um, were displaced and their home damaged by Hurricane Michael. And January 4th of this year, my daddy went home to be with Jesus. So how do we apply this today? We couldn't do this alone. Come on now. My hubby and daughter pitched in to help carry the load. Amen. Kiana and April went with me to help mom clean her apartment. Vincent had to spend almost three weeks in Florida with his parents to get them help and secure their home, mm-hmm. along with our youngest son, Jonathan. Helping with the cleanup and restoring the house and the property. And then last month, we all traveled to, to Georgia and Trudy and Trenise checked on my mother. You might say, yeah, but that's your mom and his parents, so of course you did those things. But how many of us know how family dynamics mm-hmm. Where for various reasons, those things don't happen. Mm-hmm. But you, Covenant Lighthouse, you, the disciples whom Jesus loves, mm-hmm. you checked on me and Vincent while we were trying to provide safety and security for our parents. You were so encouraging. Then when Daddy passed away, not just my flesh and blood family, but my extended church family, mm-hmm. this house leaned into the pain and loss to walk with you during the show. Just like the disciple Jesus loved. No, you didn't take me into your home, but I would like to believe 
that if needed, I might have a seat at your table. <laughs> you walked with me, you prayed with me and for me. You brought us meals, you visited our home, you sent flowers and fruit, you made delicious cake, you gave us monetary help, you gave wonderful cards with words of love and strength. There was a little Facebook incident, but it was handled with respect. But most comforting was looking around at Daddy's service and seeing you there. Just like the disciple Jesus loved, you gave me a safe and soft place to live. I can imagine through Mary's sorrow, there was comfort the next day in being in the home and seeing the face of the disciples that Jesus loved. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you, Covenant Lighthouse, probably without even realizing it, brought to life the heart of Christ. How awesome to know we at Covenant Lighthouse can lean into each other's sorrow and show that same love and care for each other that Christ showed for his mother on the cross. Amen. Amen. Amen.
to the core of his of him must he felt to know the whole world has rejected him everything you have cherished has forsaken you friends on earth and all of heaven at a halt with no one to save you from this act that you must fulfill. Think about it. We're talking about Jesus today, but we have to remember, even though we don't live in those days, it could have been us who was going through something like this. Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice for the whole world, there is no one, nothing but pain of all kinds. Being sacrificed on this day has carried Jesus to a frame of mind to question his father. question his father. Being the sacrifice on this day, Jesus was in dismay. The conflict around him. Why hast thou forsaken me? Even though Jesus knew his father's will, he still asks, why hast thou forsaken me? This is what I believe Jesus meant when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he didn't say it like I just said it. It was more like, my God! My God, why has thou forsaken me? Was his cry. I believe that Jesus was not really looking for an answer from his father. He already knew his father's will. He already knew his father's will. He already predicted three times when he walked the earth that he was going to be crucified, that he was going to be the sacrifice for the world. He was not acting in a way to know or in a way that maybe he can pray like God why is thou forsaken me? He was asking in a way because he was in despair. He predicted his death and was in despair. In all his suffering and the chaos and the confusion, I believe that was the time that Jesus felt most human. That was the time, if it was, he kind of felt like how we are, because remember, Jesus was spirit and man. So we know that we go through times as Christians where our flesh tries to overpower the spirit. So I believe at that time, when they pierced the nails in his hands, hung him on a cross and he's hanging there in, in, in despair and suffering, I believe the flesh was rising at the time. And he asked God, why? He gave an example of how much God 
loved us. That he gave up his only son. He gave the example. He was the example of how a God loved a world, loved his creation, loved you and I so much that he gave up his only son. This is how we should love one another. This is how he was an example on how much he has loved us that he sacrificed his life for you and for me. This is how we must think that if my brother or my sister is hurting or someone wants to kill this person, that you can do this and say no. That you can love another human as much as yourself. That's the type of love Jesus came to express to us. He felt the pain in his flesh, or should I say, our sins. The immorality, the crime of mankind, the crime that mankind has committed and was doing against God, was all laying on him that day. All that we are doing today or have done, it was all laying on him that day. Why hast thou forsaken me? This was a cry from Jesus, an expression of the horror of what he was feeling in the moment. He was not expecting a response from God. And his wife had no doubt that God had left him. You see, he and God already had a relationship. They already established a relationship between father and son. They already had a clear understanding of what was going to take place that day. Jesus already knew his assignment. He always does what his father will is. He always does. So even in that chaos and confusion and that time of his overwhelming feeling of betrayal and humility and oh my god you have heard the words from before we all heard this story how many times we knew what Jesus went through that day but through it all he obeyed his father he was obedient even to the fulfillment of the word he was the word. He did not need an answer. There was a real forsakening going on. There it was a real forsakening going on. There was a real abandonment from his father. Your mother and father, Jennifer, you know how much they love you. I see you. I see your mother and father. I see your mother and father. I see you. You all grow together, right? Can you imagine your mother and father, someone is trying to murder you and they turn their back on you. How would you feel? Now, Jesus knew that day on the cross that he had to do his father well. There was a real forsaken in, in his soul. And knowing that, Jesus was in despair. His flesh had to be defeated 
So of course, in the defeat man, it had to rise up so he can feel all the things of the world, all the wrong things that we are doing or did. I'm not talking about anybody here, right? <laughs> not anybody here. Because we are his children. We are the saints who will judge the world with him when he comes back. His flesh was trying to defeat him. And through it all, God heard his son cry. He heard his son cry. But because Jesus was wearing all our sins, all of the sins of this world, mm -hmm. our dam, God could not save him. They both were in it together. It was predicted before Jesus came. Scriptures were being fulfilled. Jesus being forsaken was a cry. A why from being in the assembly of the wicked and having to deal with the agony, that's where his why came from. The agony, the pain, why, why? His cry was embedded in the wickedness of the world. Should I say that again? His cry, his cry, his cry was embedded in the wickedness of the world. But even in all of this <coughs> turmoil, he knew. Pray, O oh Lord, that I decrease, O oh Father God, that you fill me up, O oh Father God, and that you speak through me the word that you would like for your people to hear, O oh Lord. I thank you for this opportunity, and I pray that you bless everyone in here. I pray that one person, O oh Father God, if not many, are reached tonight. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I have the fifth word, I thirst. I'm coming from... John 19, 28, and I would like to read the King James Version and the NIV Version. John 19, 28, the King James Version says, After this, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And in the NIV Version, John 19, 28, later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A little backstory. I received a phone call a couple months ago from Pastor C that was just up here with the microphone. And he asked me if I remembered having a conversation last year. I said eight words. Eight words. Eight words that I'll never forget. So to Kiana and Carolyn, I actually got into their conversation. You know how they say stay out of the Kool-Aid? Got into their conversation. And they were talking about delivering a message of one of the words this year. And so they both said to one another, if you do it, I'll do it. Eight words. I said, if you do it, I'll do it. So never thinking I would revisit that conversation again. <laughs> Pastor C called me a couple months ago and said, remember what you said? <laughs> I happen to be a woman of my word. I'm standing before you. Amen. So pray with me. As I share what God has given me from John 19, 28, I thirst. We thirst for so many things in this world. And I will share some of our thirst and how it relates to our Savior, Jesus Christ, within the next few minutes. Tonight we will look at how scripture was fulfilled and how Jesus showed his connection to humanity. We have listened and learned of all that Jesus went through leading up to this moment. Our Savior was beaten, mocked, hung on the cross, and left to die, and he took it all without asking for anything for himself. 
Matter of fact, when he was offered vinegar with gall, he declined, leaving him to feel all of the pain intended for him. Up until now, he didn't complain or cry out for help. But at this very moment, he showed his connection to humanity and that he had a need by saying, I thirst. He was offered wine vinegar that was soaked on a sponge to quench his thirst, to wet his lips. At this moment, we see how prophecy was fulfilled from the Old Testament in Psalm 22, 15. The New Living Translation says, my strength has dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. Psalm 69, 21, but instead they give me poison for food. They offer me sour wine for my thirst. Reading these verses shows us how prophecy was fulfilled as our Savior stated he was thirsty in John 19, 28. I looked up the meaning of thirst and thirsty. Have you ever had a moment where you felt like you were extremely thirsty and needed a drink? Some may recall drinking a little juice, soda, milk, even liquor to quench the thirst. But the only real liquid that fulfilled the thirst was water. Research shows that our bodies are made up of 70% water and by the time we experience dry mouth, we are already at a deficit of two quarts of water. A quart of water within our bodies. So I say, continue to drink water frequently so that you won't feel like you are dried up in dire need, worn out, and cannot make it. The same way we should continue to read our word daily, see God's face, accept Jesus Christ as our savior, and truly live according to his word so that we don't feel defeated, worn out, and like we cannot make it. According to WebMD, thirst is your body's way of telling you that it's running low on water, which it needs to work well. It's normal to feel thirsty when it's hot or after you've powered through an intense workout. That's according to WebMD. Think about Jesus as it relates to powering through an intense workout. He powered through carrying the cross, a crown of thorns being placed on his head, the brutal beatings of others, nails through his feet and hands, and being pierced through his side. They crucified our Savior, yet he didn't ask for anything until he knew that what he had come to do was completed. And it was at that moment that he said, I thirst. Thirst in recent internet slang describes a graceless need for approval, affection or attention, one so raw that it creeps people out. Mm. I asked a few people, what does the word thirsty mean? Mm. It was defined as not drinking enough water by several. A teenager said that it means that the girls were all over dudes, or dudes want to be like him or have what he has. Mm -hmm. It was also defined as striving for attention, attention, being pressed, doing too much, mm -hmm. being annoying all relating to a new term, doing it for the clout. Social media right now is a good way to see these examples of thirsty as people seek to outdo one another. I thought about social media and looked at Facebook. Look at the prom experience today. Some of you that are on social media, you see the prom experience. I recall a couple of young ladies last year arriving in an ambulance for prom. One arrived in a coffin mm -hmm. to, to attend prom. Mm -hmm. All of these explanations show that there's a lack within someone mm -hmm. that needs fulfilling. Mm -hmm. One lack is a drink, is needing a drink of water to replenish the body. And the others show that there's a personal struggle within mm -hmm. that needs fulfilling. Mm -hmm. For some, it may be undealt with pain mm -hmm. or current or past struggles. Some of us may have missed out on some form of validation from someone important in our lives, and we are fighting to be noticed or important now. Some of us have just gotten caught up in the hype of social media, or keeping up with the Joneses. It is important to know that we don't have to thirst after what others have, or to be like others, but only to seek to thirst after God's word and his will for our lives. God has given his word and his people to help us power through 
every third situation that arises in our lives. The word of God says in 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Jesus is the answer for all things. We just have to drink of the living water. According to one commentary, Jesus talked a lot about being thirsty, such as when he spoke to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. If you recall, Jesus asked the Samaritan woman to give him a drink. The woman responded, how is it that you, a Jew, asked a drink of me, a Samaritan, a woman of Samaria? Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you and he would have given you living water. Their conversation continued, and Jesus demonstrated to the woman her own need, her own thirst for something more than water. Did you know you were set aside for a purpose, and you don't have to thirst anymore? Jesus suffered without a complaint, and then at the exact moment he needed to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. I am not saying that you need to suffer without a complaint. But what I am saying is that when you feel perplexed, hopeless, broken, beaten down like Jesus was on the cross, or like the life is being sucked out of you, like when he was pierced in his side, what I am saying is that you serve a living Savior that will replenish your thirst time after time after time. Trust him. Fall in love with him. Believe in him. Hold on to him. Accept him as your savior. And I promise you, you will never thirst again. Jesus said in his word, John 4, 14, he is the living water. And whoever drinks of the water I give you will never be thirsty. Thank you. I think it's somebody was thirsty. <laughs> they want to drink. It is finished. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs>
wide open. Part of Matthew 7, 13 says, For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. This door here, the one that is wide open, represents the door to hell. Yeah. It's available to everyone. And honestly, before Christ's work, it was the only choice we had. Yeah. That's right, the only choice. Yeah. Without Christ granting it and paying the price, death and eternal separation from God was our only option. However, if you follow me to the back of the room, <laughs> because Jesus paid the price for our sins, we went from only having one option to having two. All right, All right. All right. Now, we saw one door that is wide open. We saw one door that is wide open. Make no mistake. It's still an option for you. And in fact, it's the easy way out. You don't have to do a single thing. Deny Christ and just keep on living the way you're living. And when God says your time is up, it won't right on through. But God loves us so much that he decided to give us a choice, a second door. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. People always read just John 3.16, but verse 17 is just as important. So I like to include them together. Verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God didn't want this one door to be our only option. He doesn't want to condemn us. He doesn't want to be separated from us. He loves us. He adores us. So instead of one door, one way out, he decided to give us another choice. This one is wide open. This one here is wide open. But the other is shut. Why is that one shut, you ask? Because Jesus is a gentleman. He has a key to your heart, but he doesn't just barge in. He wants you to make the choice. Jesus is on one side, and you're on the other. Jesus stands there, and he knocks. But it's you who has the choice to open the door. Amen. Revelation 3.20 says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. For those of you who aren't saved, it's your choice to open the door. Or you can walk through this door wide open if you'd like. So, think of it. so for those of us who already are saved, you may think, Jennifer, that was a cool message. I like your door example. <laughs> but I'm saved, so this message really doesn't mean anything to me. But think about this. I kept saying Christ's work on the cross. I kept calling it work. He said it is finished. But by it, he meant his work is done. All right. All right. Ours isn't. He left heaven and came here to serve and to save. Now, once we open that door, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's our turn to serve and lead others to the Savior. In the first chapter of Acts, Luke recounts how after Jesus' resurrection, he was explaining to the apostles that once they receive the power of the Holy Spirit, they are to be his witnesses. And in Acts 1, 9, and 10, it says, after he said this, he being Jesus, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky where he was going. And suddenly, two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Sometimes Christians, that's us, this world is in such a state of chaos and despair, we're looking up at the sky like, Jesus, please come back. <laughs> uh, you can describe this project. I'm ready for you to come on. I can't take this anymore. But there's so many more out there who need to be saved. Yeah. There's so many more out there who only see one door. Yeah. I heard someone once say that we treat God like a genie. Mm. We always have our hands out, yeah. calling to God like, what have you done for me lately? Mm. God did his part. Yeah. If he never, never gave us another thing, right. honestly, that would be enough. Amen. Amen. I say that, but I'm like, God, I need a new job, so. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing wrong with praying or asking God for anything. All right, all right. But we also have to remember that we're ambassadors here. 
Our citizenship is in heaven. Yes. Yes. We're ambassadors here on earth. Yes. We have to ask ourselves, what can I do for God? How can I help further his kingdom to the ends of the earth? That second door is now available to everyone. But there are still plenty of others out there who are only looking at walking through that first door. Mm-hmm. Help them open, open the second door. That's our work. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, I stand before you on tonight, leaning on your promises. As I deliver the words you have given me to speak, Father, let your message be etched upon the heart and minds of your people. We have been to the mountaintop. We have been in the valley. Thank you, Jesus, that we have never been crucified on the cross. Amen. Amen. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. These were Jesus' last words as a man, found in Luke 23, 46. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Mm -hmm. Paul said in Philippians 3, 10, that the passion of his life was to know the power of Christ's resurrection and to share his sufferings and become like him in his death. I think we should follow Paul in this. We should draw, we should long to draw from Christ the power to live and die like he did. Surely that is one of the reasons the Gospels show, the gospel show us so much of Jesus' death. God's will for us is that we learn from Jesus how to die. Jesus' suffering and your suffering. It is a strange and terrible perversion that the gospel, on the gospel to say that since Jesus suffered for me, therefore, I don't have to suffer. Mm -hmm. I can be comfortable and prosperous. Mm -hmm. The stumbling block of the cross is removed if we say he became homeless, that I might have the finest houses. Mm -hmm. He was rejected by men that I might be admired among men. Mm -hmm. He lived in poverty that I might live in luxury. He endured suffering that I might enjoy, sorry, that I might enjoy ease. Jesus taught just the opposite. If any man were to come after me, let him take up his cross daily, 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 and follow me. If we suffer with him, we shall be glorified with him, as stated in Romans 8, 17. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps, as is stated in 1 Peter 2, 21. Have you ever had so many things that you needed to do that you had to make a checklist? <laughs> if Jesus had made a checklist as he was in his final hours, minutes, what would that checklist look like? Hmm. Father, you sent me from heaven to earth in the form of a man. Along with several of these things he did, he would sound like Have I completed all these tasks? 
So speaking as possibly Christ would speak, given his list, not all of his items, I will share with you. The spirit of my father is upon me. I preached the gospel to the poor. Mm -hmm. I healed the broken heart. Mm -hmm. I preached deliverance to the captives. Mm -hmm. I recovered sight to the blind. I set the oppressed free. Mm -hmm. So that I can preach the acceptable year of my father. I was